Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Saloni Khanderia Yadav and I am from National Law University, Delhi. Today I would be explaining the principle of most favoured nation treatment as elucidated under Article 1 of the GATT 1947. The objectives of this module would be to understand the principle of most favoured nation as the cornerstone of the GATT and its bearing on international trade policy regulation. Also to understand the origins of this principle along with the scope of this provision as provided by virtue of Article 1 of the GATT 1947 with respect to discrimination both de jure and de facto. Hence, we would be discussing the following modules. We would be understanding the introduction to most favoured nation treatment, the historical analysis of most favoured nation treatment principle, the two types of discrimination being de jure and de facto discrimination. There apart, we would be understanding the most favoured nation treatment obligations under the GATT by virtue of understanding the scope of MFN, the types of measures covered, the conduct which is discriminatory by nature, the product that is belonging to a WTO member and the product that must be a like product. Thereafter, we would also understand the exceptions of the MFN principle along with understanding the summary of this module. Now, the principle of most favoured nation treatment, popularly known as the MFN treatment, is a fundamental principle of trade ensuring non-discrimination between like goods and services and relates to providing the same benefit and concession to one member in case benefits and concessions are provided to another member. This therefore ensures non-discrimination. For this, we must understand the historical analysis of the origin of MFN principle. The origins of MFN is said to be traced back to the World War I, with European trade alliances being one of the major reasons that the war due to the discriminatory practices. Countries therefore realized the importance of the MFN clause and began to negotiate various bilateral and plurilateral agreements during the war. The birth of the League of Nations then saw the inclusion of an unconditional MFN clause to promote principles of free trade. Now we would understand the principle of MFN and the GATT 1947. Given the change in circumstances and the new economic scenario, equality of treatment to importers inter se became imperative with the drafting conferences in the GATT in London 1946 and Geneva 1947 making MFN treatment the cornerstone of the ITO Charter. With the failure of the ITO Charter, MFN treatment was successfully added in the form of Article 1 of the GATT to assure traders that they would, would be treated equally in the exports of like products and that any concession granted to one member shall unconditionally be granted to another. With this, the principle of MFN and the WTO is that with the conclusion of the Uruguay Round negotiations in 1994, at the Ministerial Conference of Marrakesh on 15th April 1994, various agreements were part of the new World Trade Organization as a new start to international trade law. Countries therefore began to realize that there was more to trade in goods and due to new developments in technology and expertise in various services, countries began to export services like never before. With this mutual interdependence of members, there was a need to assure trading partners that their services and service suppliers would be given the same treatment as that of like services and service suppliers of other members. MFN treatment was hence not limited merely to trade in goods but also to trade in services. But we must remember one thing that Article 1 of the GATT 1947 pertains only to goods uh, discrimination in goods and not to services. This is because GATT pertains to trade in goods and the GATS pertains to trade in services. Hence, this module would only be discussing MFN principle as applicable to trade in goods and the GATS would be pertaining to MFN treatment as applicable to trade in services. With this, we must now understand the modes of discrimination. Like I mentioned before, there are two modes of discrimination. One being de jure discrimination and the second one being de facto discrimination. De by de jure discrimination, we mean that discrimination that is spelt out by law. 
Hence, when foreign goods and services are not given the same treatment as domestic goods or services that which are given um, are by other members despite being similar or like, this is the case of T-jaw discrimination. Uh, for an example, I can explain. Supposing a member, let's say India, has spelled out in its law that when goods that are originating in the United States would be subject to higher customs duty, let's say 10%, whereas other uh, goods from originating from other members are subject to 9%. This because it is spelled out in a law, regulation or requirement. And it is so clear and apparent that goods because they are originating in the United States are subject to higher customs duties when they enter into India. This is a de jure discrimination because it is spelt out by the Indian law. On the other hand, de facto discrimination is something that is not as explicit as de jure discrimination and is implicit in the type of measures used because it is very rare that any country would want to spell it out in the law regulation and requirement that it actually intends to discriminate against another country. Hence, de facto discrimination is a more common form of discrimination because this is implied and it is difficult to prove. For example, there may be a variable tax rate on beverages with high alcohol content than those with low alcohol content. There being no dis real discrimination apparent in such a measure, it will be regarded as de facto discrimination if based on the market scenario, domestic beverages have a low content and imported beverages have a high alcohol content. This was commonly seen in the chili alcoholic beverages case, which proved that on the face of it, there was no real discrimination, but Chile preferred to discriminate against uh, alcoholic beverages that had a high alcohol content because Chile itself produced low alcoholic content beverages. Hence, this was a type of de facto discrimination. Now, we must discuss the non-discrimination and Article 1 of the GATT 1947. Article 1 of the GATT additionally calls for non-discrimination amongst members inter se in the importation of products that are like. Article 1, Clause 1, hence states that any advantage, favor, privilege or immunity granted by any member to any product originating in or destined for any other country shall be accorded immediately and unconditionally to the like product originating in or destined for the territories of other members. With this, there are few things that must be understood in order to understand the true meaning of Article 1, Clause 1. For this, we must first understand the measures covered under Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT 1947. Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT 1947 pertains to few measures that are applicable in order to prove that there is some form of discrimination. Firstly, it must be with respect to customs duties and charges of any kind. This means that customs duties must be different for goods that are being imported or exported or the charges must be different. For example, when goods are being imported, the charges such as transportation and warehousing charges could be different for like products only because they are imported. Hence, supposing goods from the United States are subject to different warehousing charges than those for like products from India, then that is subject to discrimination by virtue of Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT. Secondly, the charge imposed on the internal transfer of payment must be different for imports or exports in order to apply Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT. This means that when there is an internal transfer of payment, then the, the charge must be different. For example, if a country wants to transfer money in order to buy certain products from another company, and supposing they are subject to different internal charges for payments. For example, if uh, an internal charge, internal transfer of payment subjects them to different charges for, for by virtue of let's say Western Union, then that is subject to Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT because you cannot have different charges applicable to different products when they are similar products. Then the method of levying such duties and charges must be different. For example, one must be subject to, one may be subject to ad valorem duty, 
the second may be subject to specific duties then that for like products then that is a different type of discrimination other rules and formalities in connection with importation or exportation is another form of measure that is covered by article 1 clause 1 of the gat hence article 1 clause 1 of the gat primarily covers four types of measures that is the measures in the form of customs duties and charges then the charge imposed on the internal transfer of payment the method of levying such duty and the other rules and formalities which are discriminatory for like products S lastly the measures referred to article 3 clause 4 of the gap now article 3 clause 4 refers to the principle of national treatment article 3 clause 4 on the other hand refers to the principle of national treatment with specific reference to laws regulation and requirement for sale transportation etc so if a good is subjected to different laws regulations and requirements with respect to let's say sale purchase transportation etc when it is being imported or exported then this is this comes within the virtue of article 1 clause 1 of the gap The conduct which is discriminatory by nature, we must understand that conduct under article 1 of the GATT refers to only governmental measures. As a result of prohibiting any conduct which has a consequence of being discriminatory by nature, article 1 clause 1 covers even measures that are discriminatory on exports and imports. Hence, we must understand that it is exports and imports that are subject to article 1 clause 1. The impact of the conduct should be that the conduct must be discriminatory towards a product that belongs to a WTO member and the product must be a like product. We, these are two important criteria because if a product does not belong to a WTO member, it is not subject to article 1 clause 1. Secondly, if the product is not like within the meaning of article 1 clause 1 and within the given jurisprudence of uh, the GATT then it is not subject to article 1 clause 1 again. How do we understand that the product belongs to a WTO member? Firstly, the advantage, favor, privilege or immunity must be extended to any country. Thus, such country which receives such advantage, favor, privilege or immunity need not be a WTO member but may still receive favorable treatment by another WTO member. Let's say for example, the United States is a member of the WTO, Iraq is not a member of the WTO. So the United States extends some advantage of favor or privilege or immunity to Iraq. Now such favorable treatment to Iraq, let's say by a customs duty negotiated at the rate 5%, such favorable treatment must be extended to all other WTO members. Hence supposing United States is charging a customs duty at 6% to WTO members but 5% to Iraq which is not a WTO member, the 5% must be immediately extended to all other WTO members. Thirdly, not only should such favorable treatment be extended to all other WTO members but must be done immediately and unconditionally. This means that if the United States is allowing a customs duty of 5% to Iraq, it must extend such treatment to all other WTO countries immediately and unconditionally. For example, it cannot impose a condition on India saying that it must extend some other advantage in return in order to get the benefit of 5% customs duty. With this, we have understood that the advantage, favor, privilege or immunity can be granted by a WTO member to any other country. But this favor, advantage, privilege or immunity must be given to a WTO member immediately. In other words, if a WTO member, let's say the United States, is granting this advantage, favor, privilege or immunity to India, a WTO member, it need not give it to Iraq, which is not a WTO member. So this, in other words, this, um, advantage, favor, privilege or immunity need not be given to a non-member but if it is given to a non-member it must be given to a member immediately and unconditionally. 
how do we understand that a product is like? The jurisprudence of concept of likeness evolved in the case of border tax adjustment wherein the panel laid down the guidelines to determine like products by the following four criteria. These criteria were the property, nature and quality of the products, the end uses of the product, consumer tastes and habits and tariff classification of the product. It is important to note that when one is proving what is a like product, one need not prove all these four criteria to be existing. Even if one or more exists, it is enough to prove that two products are similar. Hence, the physical properties, the extent to which the product may be perceived as serving the same end use, the extent to which consumers perceive and treat the products as an alternative, and the international classification of the products for tariff purposes is what ought to be taken into account. The evolution of like products and the Japan alcoholic beverages dispute. The question in this case was whether sochu, which is a traditional Japanese alcoholic beverage, is similar to vodka, gin, geneva, whiskey and rum. The panel in this case held that it could adjudicate sochu and vodka as a like but it could not adjudicate sochu as being alike to rum, gin, geneva, whiskey and other, other alcoholic beverages. This is because sochu and vodka shared the same physical characteristic and even had the same end use. Whereas sochu and rum, they too could not be considered as like products because of the difference in the ingredients that were used to make these alcoholic beverages. Sochu and whiskey on the other hand, had different appearances altogether. Sochu and gin and geneva could not be considered as like because gin and geneva had certain addictives used in them. In order to understand the concept of like products with the help of EC Bananas dispute, the question that revolved here was around the bananas import regime of the EC. The EC identified three types of bananas. One was bananas from the EC itself, which received duty free treatment. Next was ACP bananas, those being bananas originating from African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. Few countries were um, delineated with this and they received duty free treatment subject to quotas allocated to 12 countries. These quotas allocated to 12 countries were known as traditional bananas. Lastly. ACP countries which exceeded the quotas mentioned above and including the 12 countries. These were known as non-traditional bananas. In other words, there were three types of bananas segregated. Bananas from EC for duty free treatment, ACP bananas which were allocated to 12 countries known as traditional bananas and they received duty free treatment if the bananas were originating from these 12 countries of the ACP. Lastly, ACP countries which were, which were also part of these 12 countries but which exceeded the quotas already allocated and these were known as non-traditional bananas. The question in this case was whether these three bananas originating from EC, the ACP bananas with the quota from the 12 countries and the ACP countries which exceeded the quota that is in other words uh, bananas from EC, bananas which are traditional bananas and bananas which are non-traditional bananas are like or not. The appellate body noted that the essence of the non-discrimination obligation is that like products are treated equally irrespective of their origin. The appellate bodies further clarified that the obligation of non-discrimination may be waived in case of existence of a customs union of free trade areas approved by article 24 of the GATT. Like products are hence discriminated against when government measures either in the form of customs duties and charges or the method of levying the same or the rules and regulations thereof so operate to discriminate between the two products rather than between two countries. Hence if in this case the bananas would not like at all then it could not be a question as for whether there is discrimination because in the case of EC bananas the bananas were like but there was discrimination based on the origin of the country it was adjudicated by the appellate body that there is a violation of article 1 clause 1 of the GATT. Now we would be understanding the exceptions to article 1 of the GATT 1947. Primarily there are three exceptions to the GATT 1947 article 1. They being 1 customs union, 2 free trade areas and 3 
preferential treatment giving, given to developing country members of the WTO, whereas customs union and free trade areas are elucidated by virtue of Article 24 of the GATT. They are forms of regional trade agreements. These are explained in another module. However, for the sake of understanding these two concepts as an exception to Article 1 of the GATT, I would be providing a brief explanation of both customs union and free trade areas. 1. Customs union. Customs union is when two or more countries come together in order to liberalize trade and because of this, they eliminate substantially all duties and other restrictive regulations of trade. Now for this, because of liberalizing trade and eliminating other regulative restrictions of trade, they are bound to give the same duties to other countries which are not members of the customs union. In other words, members must have common duties to other non-members. So supposing A, B and C come together to form a customs union, then A, B and C must decide upon a common customs duty and provide the same customs duty to D which is not a member. This is not the case in case of free trade areas. In case of free trade areas, two or more customs union come together to liberalize trade and eliminate substantially all duties and regulative restrictions between them. However, unlike in the case of customs union, in case of free trade areas, countries are not bound to provide common customs duty to countries which are not the member. For example, if A, B and C are members of a free trade area, they need not decide upon a common duty to D which is not a member. So, whereas in customs union there are common duties for countries which are not the member, which is provided from country which is a member, this is not the case in case of a free trade area. This is primarily one difference. Lastly, another exception to Article 1 of the GATT is preferential treatment provided to developing country members. The enabling clause authorizes members to deviate from MFN obligations under Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT and accord differential and more favorable treatment to developing countries without according the same to other members. In other words, developing countries are given special and more differential treatment when because they are developing countries. Preferential treatment may therefore be accorded in accordance with the generalized system of preferences by members of developed countries to products originating in developing countries. So these are primarily three exceptions to the GATT by virtue of which as elucidated in the previous minutes, any advantage, favor, privilege or immunity that is given by a WTO member to another country must be given to another member immediately and unconditionally. This no, does not need to apply in the case of these three scenarios. They are customs union, free trade areas and preferential treatment to developing countries. Hence, in short, in case an advantage, favor, privilege or immunity is provided by virtue of being a member of a customs union, a free trade area or a developing country, this need not be extended to other members and this is an exception to the MFN principle elucidated in Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT. With this, we have come to the end of this module and we have understood few fundamental concepts. With this, we have understood that the concept of most favored nation treatment as elucidated in Article 1, Clause 1 of the GATT requires an analysis of four main concepts to verify the existence or of non-discrimination. They are whether there is an advantage created by a measure. Like I mentioned before, this measure must be a governmental measure. It must not be a measure by a private party. Now for this, I can provide an example. In the case of Japan photographic film dispute, there was an advantage which was, which was not really a governmental measure, but rather it was a private party measure. In that case, the question arose whether Japan 
had created a discriminatory measure which albeit being a private measure could be bought into virtue of article 1 clause 1 of the GATT. It was decided out here by the panel that although this was a private party measure, it could be associated as a government measure if there is a collusion or there is an incentive or disincentive provided by the government to the private party. Hence, although article 1 clause 1 and for that matter any other provision of the GATT or the WTO is applicable only to a government measure, it may be associated or attributable to a government measure if the government has collided or collu colluded with another private party or it has provided an incentive or disincentive to a private party to do the act that it is doing. In such cases, of course, the government is responsible for such non-discriminatory measures. Second, we must understand what the products are affected by the measure are like. We have understood by virtue of three major case laws that were provided here. One is the border tax adjustment case, second the Japan alcoholic beverages case and thirdly the EC bananas case. That in order to understand that the measures are like, we must see the physical properties, the end uses, consumer tastes and habits and the tariff classification. If the products are not like, then it is no point and it is not come into virtue of article 1 clause 1 of the GATT. For example, we need to see whether the products are similar in all other terms, whether the product, whether the consumer would revert to another product in case one product is not available. Only then is such a product a like product or in other circumstances, we can see whether the physical properties or the end uses are the same. So, if the end uses are similar, for example, one soap could be considered as like to another soap, if the physical properties and the end uses is the same. These are basically characteristics of how to understand whether products are like. Then we also understand, understood whether the disputed measure is a type of measure regulated by the MFN provision. Then we also understood whether the advantage is not offered to all other products unconditionally. With this I also explained with the example of the United States offering a customs duty of 5% to Iraq which is not a member of the WTO. Because it has offered 5% customs duty to Iraq which is not a WTO member, US has the obligation to offer this advantage or this favor or this privilege or immunity to all other WTO members immediately and unconditionally. Hence, it cannot tell other WTO members that only upon them giving them some other advantage, giving the US some other advantage, it would provide this 5% customs duty to other members. But on the other hand, US must provide this measure this advantage to all other WTO country members immediately and unconditionally. With this, we have understood that most favored nation treatment basically tries to, on the whole, understand two types of discrimination and prevent these two types of discrimination. One is de facto and the second is de jure discrimination. Thank you very much.